Greetings. This is New Light Meeting House presents. In college a couple years ago, I took a world history class. At the beginning of the semester, the professor tested students' general knowledge. He asked us to raise our hands if the United States had won the Second World War. My arm shot up, along with a couple other history majors. But quietly, rather oddly, the majority of students did not know the answer to that question. So he asked it again, with more emphasis. He said, did the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain win the Second World War? A couple more arms went up. Still less than a majority. Maybe students thought he was trying to trick them with a nuanced third answer. Teachers like to do that sort of thing, but he wasn't. He truly sought students to give them a clear and correct answer. But sadly, most appeared just not to know. I was dumbfounded, and he was disheartened to say the least. And to make things worse, there was a girl behind me that said, the United States wasn't involved in World War II, like she had found the correct answer. Unfortunately, that baffling experience does not remain alone for me. Many more episodes in college I can recount that opened my eyes to the unfortunate reality of historical illiteracy. Thinking deeper on why people, especially college grads, don't know history, I came across a verse from scripture from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter four, beginning at the ninth verse. And if I can recall it from memory, it's, but take care and watch yourselves closely so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and to your children's children. Moses was giving a farewell address to the Hebrews right before their entrance into the Promised Land. They had been in slavery for 400 years in Egypt. They had crossed the Red Sea. They'd spent another 40 more years wandering in the wilderness and now approached the edge of a place only heard about through oral tales concerning their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who sojourned there. All the remarkable feats of God against Pharaoh were complete. This is the overall context in which the author penned these lines. And thinking about that, we have to note that a collective social experience remains a powerful tool for maintaining a collective social memory. One of the reasons biblical religion still persuades adherents like myself is that the faith is primarily told through a narrative of decisive events that have meaning for the faithful. By binding oneself to the faith community, folks become part of a lineage that extends back to Abraham, even though they may be Gentiles who didn't witness those extraordinary events. Faith, history, working together. On the day like the 4th of July, folks remember the Declaration of Independence is signing, even though it was ratified on the 2nd. On Veterans Day, we remember folks who served in our, our country. On Memorial Day, for those who died while serving. On Thanksgiving, we remember the first harvest of the pilgrims. And when we thank God for the manifold blessings that he's given us. Those secular days, events, usually historical events, mark times that shape our social, collective social experience. World War II is one of those historical events that you don't forget, you don't brush over. It affected too much of our collective social history. And perhaps one of the other reasons why I was so astounded that the girl said the United States wasn't involved in World War II. My grandfather Hogg, I heard him tell about his time in the service, be it ever so short. Although my grandfather Brown died before my time, I know from my mother and war documents that he served four years, two in India, fell in love with the people, got sick of malaria, and helped a German POW once remove a nail out of his foot, purely out of the kindness of his Christian character. Americans were not involved. My Uncle Paul, he served in Germany. Uncle Lofton at the Battle of the Bulge. Third cousin Dick Kennedy climbed up Point de Hoc on D-Day 1. And great uncle Ralph Brown served under General Patton, received a Purple Heart. And in fact, he was memorialized at the Tower Museum, just a short walk from our classroom. Americans were not involved. 
Perhaps she had no relatives that served in the war, or she was a first-generation American. In any case, she, along with the other half in the class, did not share the same dismay that swept over me and probably a few others when hearing students' cluelessness. And it's at this point we have to ask ourselves, if we share no uplifting collective memory of U.S. victory in World War II, can we, be, can we even be considered the same people? What, if any, tie can bind us as Americans? And do we really think that our national wounds can heal that have been exacerbated over the last 10, 20, some 60 years? Or, and I'm afraid this is where we're going, shall we go deeper into a dark cavern of ignorance where no lights shine, but only the gray memories of a tarnished past? I'm afraid there is no turning back. I dread it every day. I fear that the seeds of dementia have taken root into our national consciousness and have resorted our nation to a piteous state. Unless, unless we begin to tell the story, their story and our story, to tell the tale with all of its glory and shame, although the latter seems to be the more popular. It's only by recounting the deeds of our ancestors and the continual forbearance of providence with pathos and charisma that we can ever hope to bring light to the mind of a forgetful people. Yes, these things have slipped from our minds. We failed. We've become as the Israelites who forgot their God, history, heritage, and law, and have gone after strange gods, strange notions of themselves. But it's at times like this that we need a righteous king like Josiah, who recovered the book of the law found by Hilkiah and instituted reforms in Israel, who led the people, his country, back to the root of their existence, to God.